Hello audience, my name is Tony Carnes with a Journey Through NYC Religions. What if you could put in your pocket the wisdom of hundreds of heroes to guide you through a year? What if you could call upon it on one day as somebody who's felt some of the same stresses that you have that has written out that this is how you handle them? We have here today a Joe Holland who is going to help us recover this wisdom for our daily life. Joe is a writer, a pastor to the homeless at one time, a pastor at uh, Bethel uh, Gospel in Harlem, a politician, having run for, uh, having been in office and also having run for office, and an all-American football star. He's going to help us how we can do this magnificent feat to have a pocket full of heroes for our, for our year. Thank you, Joe, for being here. Well, thank you, Tony. So great to, to be on with you today and to be able to talk about something that I consider to be so important, so powerful for our daily lives. Now, we're pivoting around this book that is coming out and will probably be out by the time uh, we broadcast. Yes. Called The Vir Vigorous Virtues. And you have here a, a spectrum of heroes that are quite diverse, and you call it a historical devotional. And how diverse are the heroes in this book? They are very diverse, Tony, and that's one of the unique features of the book. Yes, you see in this photograph, I do have the founding fathers here, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Hamilton, and Franklin. No doubt there are daily entries from the Founding Fathers. But more important is the diversity because we hear from unsung heroes, right? There are people that we don't necessarily read about in our history courses in, in school, but yet serve a very important role, have a very impactful voice if we just understand how we can look back draw truths from their experience in ways that we can apply it, apply it to our daily life. How is the book organized? I call it The Vigorous Virtues, Tony, because we as Americans are great because of our, our virtues, because of our values. It is those virtues of life that determine the success of life. And so I have focused in on 12. How did you get those 12? Through my study of American history. I, I, I do have a, uh, a bachelor's from Cornell University as well as a master's in history before going on to law school. And history has always been a passion of mine and I've, I've studied it across the years. And so I looked at what are those, those character traits that have really made a difference in the lives of America. And, and I came up with, with 12. For example, January is courage. February is self-discipline. March is compassion. April is perseverance, and so forth throughout the year. And it ends with faith, Tony. And that's, to me, as, as a man of faith, uh, the most important of the, the 12 vigorous virtues. Now, each and each month is, has a vigorous virtue and each day has a hero and uh, that talks about some aspect of that virtue and you, then you draw lessons, often in their own words, about how to apply or practice or the importance of that virtue. And it is incredibly rich that you read through like in Courage and you take, you take 30 different takes from various heroes in American history about courage and then, often in their own words, they say, these are the lessons that you can take from this. And I thought, wow, that's, that's an incredible idea for a book. And I've never seen it actually carry through as well as this book has done it. Well, just to give a, an example of that, that Tony, because I, I want you in the audience to understand the power of this approach. In January, when I talk about courage, I feature Joseph de Castro, and he is an unsung hero, but a very important figure during the Civil War because on the battle of, uh, during the Battle of Gettysburg, 
right? He was the flag bearer for the Massachusetts Regiment. And I entitle his entry, Seize Your Battlefield, because he made a bold move during this critical battle. Some people say, historians say it's the most important, but pivotal battle of the, uh, of the Civil War. He, he left his position with his flag, ran across the battlefield, and seized the flag of the flag bearer for the Virginia Regiment. The Confederate side. The Confederate side. And then ran back and passed it off to his general. And that was a moment of such inspiration that this flag bearer, that was his only weapon, would run across and use that to grab the symbol of the, of the, of the enemy. And I say seize that battlefield, and I, I draw four important points from that. These are sort of the four lessons. These are the four lessons. That you can learn on that day. That you can learn from this historical figure from that day. And the first is you have to be prepared. Courage just doesn't happen. You have to be mentally prepared for it, as De Castro was. And then be principled. Because it's the convictions that we have, the principles that we have, that underlie our strength in being able to make a bold move. And then pugnacious. It's simply a way of saying we have to be ready to fight. Life is a fight for territory. And just like De Castro, we have to be willing to have that, that fighting spirit. And that doesn't mean you're throwing punches. Sometimes you have to fight for humility. You know, you have to fight for your, your character to stay strong. And finally, prayerful, because it's a spiritual battlefield, which we can't forget about, Tony. We can't forget about that spiritual battlefield, because sometimes the only thing you can do to show courage is to look beyond yourself, to look to God and to now, pray. Do, do we know very much about De Castro, who he was, and where he came from? Yeah, he came from Massachusetts, and when uh, you know people of color were allowed to join the, the uh, Union Army, he enlisted in the all-volunteer Massachusetts De, Regiment. De Castro sounds like a Spanish name or something. Oh, he was a Hispanic American. Really? Yes, he was. He was a Hispanic American, and the historical record shows that he became, because of his great exploits on the battlefield, the first Hispanic American to be honored with the uh, Medal of Honor, which is the highest civilian award, the uh, highest award given to a, uh, a military uh, figure. You know, sometimes that reminds me that sometimes in our own communities, we have these heroes and we might not know they're there. Uh, I uh, grew up in Texas, in a little town north of my town, about 30 miles away, there was a Hispanic guy who won the Medal of Honor. And now, Medal of Honor is just the highest medal we give. I mean, this is a Medal of Valor. You, you can tell De Castro running across and grabbing the flag from That's the right. other side. That's I right. mean, that is uh, right. pretty incredible. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, if we look at that and say, no, not me, uh, or not me, but De Castro did. Well, this guy in, in, in Coro, Texas was this guy, and I only found out about this when he died. And in the obituary, they said, well, uh, in World War II, he had won the Medal of Honor and they gave the uh, incidents of why. And I thought, this guy was just a couple minutes away from mm -hmm. me. I never knew this. And I actually uh, thought to myself, said, wow. I wish I had sort of set at his feet while he was here. But what we get with you is we can set at people's feet. Some are famous, some are not so famous. Uh, one of the ones I, I, I think, of course, many people have heard of, but it's interesting that you decide to lead with her. It's in January 1st, starts with Rosa Parks. Why, yes. why did you do that? And not that she doesn't deserve it. She's an incredible woman. But why did you personally decide, well, I've got to put her first? Rosa Parks' entry on January 1st is entitled, Show Your Quiet Strength. And Tony, I, I think it's important, you know, for the audience to understand, and you think about courage, you think about the Castro types who run across the <laughs> battlefield and, you know, be very courageous. But sometimes courage is about just holding your seat, not saying a word. And Rosa Parks exemplifies that, that quiet strength because she didn't say a word. She just refused to give up her seat on a bus that was 
supposed to be for a white person yeah. in Montgomery, Alabama, and she got arrested for it, and that sparked the civil rights movement back in the 1950s that led to these historic changes in the 1960s, the Civil Rights um, Bill, the Voting Rights Act, and it really started with her show of of quiet strength. And that's something that we need to understand. It's, it's not about sometimes the loudness of, of, of our voices. It's about being able to stand our ground now based she, on what's right. She dressed up in her Sunday best when she went on the bus, yes. which just by itself almost makes your heart break. That she was going to be uh, a great representative in a quiet way. And you, you can even imagine uh, with her, I don't actually don't, I've seen pictures of her, but you know, dressed in her Sunday best and she's just sitting there uh, ready for, for God, for church. And of course she's uh, treated cruelly. You draw some lessons from that uh, experience that she has. What were the lessons you drew? Well, the most important lesson uh, from Rosa Parks, and you mentioned it, you know, was even though she's in the Courage uh, chapter, which is January, you know, it was, you know, the, the strength of her faith. And she, she does make that statement that if it wasn't, you know, for her faith in God, she would not have been able to make such a, a courageous stand. And once again, Tony, we have to understand what it is in the inner journey of these, of these heroes so that we can draw those truths and whatever your inner journey is, uh, audience member, it's important to understand how you can strengthen that, how you can rise up in that so that you can live your best self day by day. You know, somebody else I liked in January, I like, you know, I got stuck in January because there were so many interesting <laughs> entries. And, and one, I got to say, uh, one person you mentioned who is one of my all-time favorites is Marian Anderson. And tell us a little bit about her and uh, her life, why you chose her, and what does she exemplify? She, Tony, was this outstanding singer, African-American, but she had this amazing voice yeah. and she had some distinction for it and you know she was chosen to sing a concert in Constitution Hall in Washington DC but there was this group called the Daughters of the American Revolution and they they protested against her this black woman singing in the nation's capital in the 1930s and so the first lady at the time Eleanor Roosevelt resigned from the Daughters of the American Revolution, went to her husband, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt, and arranged a concert on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. That's the example that Marian Anderson shows, shows for us. And I, I love her selection so much because each of the success principles come from her own voice. I, I quote her, and she, she's able then to speak truth for well, our present circumstances. Well, you, you, you feel like she's speaking right to you when you read her quote yes. and that lesson and you think, uh, uh, well, I'm going to hear you, Marianne. I'm going to hear you. And yes. uh, that's that's why it particularly impressed me. And there were some people that I had not, uh, didn't, wasn't too familiar with. On January 7th, you mentioned somebody called Chu In Lee. Who is this person? Chu In Lee, Asian American born in, in California and decided that when World War II broke out, because it was during the 1930s, 1940s, that he was going to uh, educate himself and train uh, for a, a military career. And then he prepared himself, then the Korean War broke out, and he became an officer. And this is entitled uh, Stay Cool Under Fire. That's the title of Chu and Lee's entry because it was during a Korean War battle. Now he was a, uh, a, a sergeant or a lieutenant, lieutenant, and so he had troops under his command. And the wonderful story and why he's such a, an example of courage, he was injured in battle, 
And so he had to leave the battlefield. They were going to fly him out so that his injury could get uh, treated. Right. But he decided that he would leave the hospital. He got in the car, drove back, car ran out of gas. He walked the rest of the way to the battlefield and ended up being an inspiration to the troops as, as an injured soldier, but did not want to leave his, his command. That's incredible. I, I, I didn't know that story, and I, I was uh, really struck by this uh, uh, Chinese-American who uh, uh, not only was uh, uh, probably breaking through some barriers of race at the time, but he was also breaking through his own personal barriers, also breaking through all those walls. When people see something like that, you know, I remember uh, at your church, uh, 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 the uh, pastor, uh, uh, the founding pastor, uh, Pastor Ezra Williams. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, the, there's a story he used to tell about uh, breaking racial barriers, uh, about his, from his training in the army. Did you ever hear that story? Uh, I don't know that I have, well, Tony. This I, is very interesting. Well, yeah. he, t he told me the story. When I had him come up uh, to college, and, the, and he told this story. And he says, well, I was uh, in camp, training camp in San Antonio, Texas. And, and you know, I'm here. I'm Harlem bred, and I will be Harlem dead. And here I'm with all of these uh, guys. Some of them are mountain boys or East Texas uh, white boys. And I did not quite sure how I was going to relate to them. But one thing I discovered in training camp, I looked at them and these uh, rural white guys said, man, they could shoot. They were real good shots. So I thought to myself, I says, well, I don't feel that easy, but you know what? I want to be with the guys that can shoot. So one thing that always helps us break through counter barriers is we want to be with the people that can shoot. <laughs> 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 and uh, he told it with his verve and his tremendous uh, storytelling ability. But uh, Chu and Lee was a, a guy who could lead. Yes. And yes. you would see what he would do. And I'm sure the guys said whatever they thought about him uh, being a Chinese American, they're thinking, you know what? Wow, he just showed us what real bravery and real love for his uh, guys. Uh, uh, and that's and that's the power of of the book because I call call them diverse American heroes because it's not about the color of your skin. It's as Martin Luther King Jr. said, who I also feature in the book at various points. It's the content of your character throughout the book. You know, you have. Um, you know, lots and lots of, uh, of, of women who, who stand up, make a difference, and they're examples to us. What, well. what were some of the women that particularly stood out for you and that you use and can share in the book? Well, there's a, a familiar, well, I won't say familiar, you know, I'd say relatively more well-known figure called Susan B. Anthony, who was a, a great spokeswoman for the suffrage movement, getting women the right to vote. And there's this incident in the 1870s, right? And this was 50 years before the 19th Amendment, right? And the women's right to vote. But, you know, she's, she voted in an election and they arrested her for it. And they were about to send her to jail and she's in the courtroom and the judge, you know, says, we're gonna sentence you. And she makes this powerful statement. And this is where the courage comes in. You know, because she was not afraid to the extent where she was quiet and just sat there, but she spoke from her convictions, and that's where the courage, it's that strength that overcomes the fear. And she says, my rights have been violated, and I, I want you, Judge, to know that I believe in what I'm doing, and I'm going to stand for that, right? And so. The, the, you know, the, the judge you know, sentenced her, but there was such an outpouring of support mm -hmm. based on what she said and her courageous stand that she never served a day in, in jail. And the, the publicity around this moment helped to galvanize the, the women's rights movement and, and take it to a, a, whole, a whole new level. You know, somebody I also really liked, uh, uh, it was Phyllis Wheatley. Yes. Uh, I got to say I was so moved uh, by that 
entry that day, which I believe is in December sometime. Yes, yes, the, the faith. The faith uh, month is December. As I said, I, the, the most important um, virtue I, I, save, I save for last. And you, um, tell us a little bit about Phyllis Wheatley. Who was she? Phyllis, uh, an African, right, slave. You know, she came as a, as a girl uh, and was bought by slave owners in, in Boston. But her slave owners taught her to read the Bible. And so as a young woman, she read the Bible. Uh, she you know, converted to faith in, in Christ and was so inspired you know, by what she read in the Bible that she began to read other books, every book that she could get her hands on. So she read great literature from uh, antiquity and the Greeks, and that gave her this wonderful literary imagination, and she began to write poetry. You know, I, I, like, I, I brought a, a piece of her poetry, I brought the entry from your book, which is called Be a Faithful Voice for December 5th. And I wonder if you could, uh, man, her poem here is, um, if you don't just, your heart doesn't sing when you hear this poem, uh, well, you need to listen carefully. Could you read it for us? I, I would love, I would love to read this. And the power behind this is understanding, Tony, that you know she wrote a book of poetry, but because of slavery and the negative attitude in the colonies back in the 1700s, yes. no American publisher would do it. She had to go to England and got it published, and became she became the first. African American published uh, a person to be published, and this was one of her most famous uh, poems. It's called "On Being Brought from Africa to America." Phyllis Wheatley wrote, "Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God." that there's a savior too. Once I redemption neither sought or knew. Some view our sable race with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye. Remember Christians, Negroes black as Cain may be refined and join the angelic train. And Tony, this is so powerful because during this era, there was this great awakening. They called it the first great awakening where Christians were rising up and many were coming to faith, yet they were leaving their fellow Americans who were black, you know, behind. Phyllis said no. And she wrote this poem to let the Christians of her era know that, hey, we are just as worthy of God's grace. God didn't leave as you our are. train behind for right. African Americans. Right. God put them on the train. Right. That's right. That's right. And, um, you know, you yourself, um, some people would say, is a, a pretty heroic. Um, to fill in a little of the uh, details of your life, um, yes, you went to Cornell, you were all American on their football team. Uh, evidently a pretty good student too. Uh, you go to uh, Harvard Law yes. and somewhere in there you have a, you sort of move toward faith because you weren't as deep in faith but then you move. Can you tell us a little bit about that move where your faith started becoming more and more the center of your life? And I think it took place at Harvard particularly, but tell me a little bit about this. Yeah, Tony, I wasn't raised as a, uh, as a young man of, of, of faith, and it wasn't until I actually started my, my freshman year. I was on football scholarship at the University of Michigan, and I attended a retreat for student athletes, and that's when I first made my confession of Christ, and then it was throughout my college years that you know, I had to discover what that faith meant, and you're yes. absolutely right. It wasn't until I got through Cornell and I was at Harvard and I was attending a church in, in Boston that I really became 
stronger in faith. Where did and you attend? It was called uh, 12th Baptist Church. Oh, yes, in, of course. In the Roxbury section of yeah. Boston, yes. Pretty famous church. Yes, yeah. And so it was there I began to grow in faith, and it was during that period that God gave me, um, it was a real vision for my life. It wasn't, he wanted me to take a different course than the conventional route. A lot of my classmates and peers were going on to work in big corporate jobs on, on Wall Street and elsewhere in law firms. Uh, but God said, no, I want you to be in a position to make a difference in the community. So yes, you could you know, practice law, but I want you to do it in the community. So I moved to Harlem. Now, let's, let's wait a moment. <laughs> <laughs> You're missing out one of the big you could call it heroic. I don't know how you did it through, but your father wasn't very happy about this choice. Is that right? <laughs> he he was not. You know, both both my my parents. Your father was a a, a very noted a former ambassador yes. for the United States. Yes. Yes. Um, and he had you set going on to big white shoe law firm or something like that's, that. That's that's exactly right. Uh, and he had called a couple of his friends and had it had it all set up so uh, both my my father and and mother were quite displeased with with my direction but and I want the audience to understand there are times when you have a a deep conviction based on your faith based on what God is telling you it may not line up with you know what others are <laughs> advising you, but you it's go, important to hold then on. Then you go off to Harlem, and you don't just do anything. You end up starting a ministry for the homeless. Yes, yes. Once again, God called me to serve, and as uh, the Bible says, Jesus says it Himself: "The greatest among you are those who serve." And I, I really was seeking to live a life as a servant, and. Homelessness was a, um, it's still a big problem, but it was a, just a rampant, running rampant those days in, in Harlem. So that was what I was doing to make a difference. So if you're the audience, if you want to know a little bit about that story, you can look at his Life Lessons from the Homeless. This is another book by Joe Holland. Yes, the uh, Touchstone Tools. Yeah. Touchstone Tools. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming by today. Uh, I really would recommend you... Um, this is, a, this is a great Christmas gift. This is a great book just to have on your, your desk, The Vigorous Virtues. It's well written, it's moving, it's very practical, and I'm really grateful that you could be here today. My name's Tony Carnes for A Journey Through NYC Religion. Joe, good Thank to have you. you here. Thank you, Tony, really enjoyed the time. Thank you. Thank you.